clients. As part of our free monthly webinar series, we bring healthcare industry experts to you for a discussion of relevant topics in your field. Today, we are so pleased to have Jay Lynch, President and CEO of Boynton & Boynton, a large regional insurance company with three locations in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Today, Jay will be discussing an update on regulatory environment for the healthcare entities. Since joining Boynton and Boynton in 1993, his main responsibilities have included the development and maintenance of specialty insurance programs for the healthcare industry, school board and public entity businesses, and a coastal property program. Over 20 years, uh, Mr. Lynch designed and developed FACTS, which addresses the specific financial billing exposures faced by physicians and other healthcare entities. Mr. Lynch is recognized nationally as an expert in this discipline and has presented the insurance perspective of healthcare regulatory issues at several national and regional conventions. The program has gained underwriting support from multiple London Lloyds based insurance markets and is sold nationally through leading healthcare insurance wholesalers and brokers. FACTS currently provides coverage to nearly 40,000 physicians and other healthcare entities countrywide. Jay? Okay, well, thanks, Jill. Um, and I'd, I'd just like to thank you guys at First uh, Healthcare Compliance to uh, allow me a forum to introduce, you know, our company and our program, and um, hopefully it will be uh, somewhat educational. Uh, I'm hoping it's not the first time folks have heard that there is uh, an insurance product for what we're going to talk about today, because um, if it is the first time you've heard about it, it it's, uh, I'm not doing my job well enough, because we've been in the marketplace for excess of uh, 15 years. But um, to give you a little bit more background, um, Boynton & Boynton is a considered a retail insurance agency that provides an awful lot of medical malpractice coverage to uh, physicians throughout New Jersey and the surrounding states of New Jersey. And um, it was as a result of you know those relationships that we developed through the medical malpractice world that we began to develop a concept of providing other than med mal coverage for physician practices. And um, a big issue uh, that came on our radar screen uh, over you know, 16, 17 years ago was some of the compliance related issues that uh, you folks have been dealing with for a number of years. And when I'm talking about compliance, I'm talking about uh, predominantly uh, some of the Medicare initiatives that have been ongoing. Um, and the recovery initiatives uh, relative to the Medicare program. Um, and it was, you know, about 15, 16 years ago that we worked with several consultants and um, law firms in the country uh, to help develop something that would provide an insurance alternative uh, to, you know, handling compliance and regulatory issues, in particular, uh, Medicare, CMS, OIG, DOJ type audits. So, um, I'm real happy to, to, to be given the opportunity to talk to you guys um, about what we've learned and what we have and what we've developed over those uh, 15, 20 years. And I'm hopeful uh, that if anyone has any questions or is any, uh, has some uh, issues with what we're dealing with, uh, be, uh, you know, be happy to uh, take those questions as we go through the presentation. So we'll get on to the first slide, Joe. Um, when we first started the program a ways back, um, and it seems like a long, long time ago, um, we didn't really know how long the shelf life of the product was going to be. Um, and fortunately for us, and unfortunately for, for the industry, it doesn't seem like compliance is going to go any, uh, away anytime soon. Um, I think the issue of um, uh, health care reform, uh, the issue of uh, looking into overzealous uh, physician practices, overzealous uh, hospitals in terms of uh, either fraudulent billing or being too aggressive with billing. I don't think uh, there's any issue that the Democrats and Republicans can agree on other than this, uh, is that it's a great idea to uh, fight um, perceived fraud in the healthcare uh, you know, industry. And um, as a result of that, uh, I think it's going to be an issue that we're going to have to deal with for quite a long time. Um, and uh, again, it's, it's a very uh, strong uh, 
part of most uh, politicians' platform in terms of seeking out to uh, recover Medicare money that were overspent to physicians and, and, and hospitals. So uh, it's unfortunate, but it's the reality of what we're working with. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, many of you folks might understand that uh, the recoveries in healthcare uh, back to the Medicare program have been astronomical. Um, just in 2013, the U.S. government recovered nearly $3.8 in fraud-related civil settlements and judgments. Um, this 2014 fiscal year, which uh, the numbers came out recently, it appears that they collected about $3.4 billion um, in uh, related civil sell settlements and judge judgments from health care. Um, recoveries come in many forms, but what we're starting to see is that ICM or whistleblower cases have become a very prevalent part of how the government recovers money to the Medicare program. Um, in 2013, uh, whistleblowers, which are people who just either are employed by uh, hospitals, physician groups, or uh, their patients, or they could be even competitors, uh, they make a big recovery with every whistleblower uh, blower case that's, uh, that's settled. And in 2013, over $388 million was uh, given back to the relators of whistleblower cases. So it's a pretty big incentive for, uh, like I said, physician uh, patients, uh, physician uh, competitors, or uh, even employees to, um, uh, to turn their uh, uh, their uh, uh, position in. So uh, something that's on the uptick and something that we're concerned with when we're underwriting this type of uh, program. Um, enforcement uh, in the physician community is often centered on uh, billing, uh, particularly when there are allegations of upcoding. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit further. Um, there's also been more recently, uh, when we first started this program, it was predominantly a hospital-based program. That was our target market because that's where the issues were. Um, our program really started on the heels of some of the settlements that were coming out of uh, Philadelphia, whether it was Temple, uh, Jeff uh, uh, Jefferson Hospital, and a few others that um, had been multi-million dollar settlements with the government. Uh, we since, um, you know, focusing uh, from going from uh, hospitals, uh, we have since evolved our product into a physician-based product as well, where we actually can ensure a single physician working out of their home. So um, it's been an evolution for us, but it's kind of followed uh, how healthcare reform and how healthcare um, regulatory initiatives have developed, going from the hospital setting, to the setting all the way to uh, the single doc setting. And we've tried to evolve our product accordingly. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, I think this graph is a pretty good indicator of another reason why healthcare regulatory and compliance is going to be around for quite a bit. Um, if you take a look at the, uh, uh, the screen here, you'll see that it gives you a running total or actually an annualized recovery for each fiscal year from 2008 to 2012. Uh, the blue bar represents how much was recovered in that year. The red bar represents how much was spent in the recovery effort. Uh, so it doesn't take a genius or a uh, economic. Uh, PhD to understand that the recoveries relative to the amount that is spent are pretty significant. And it's again another sign of why you know this is going to be a long-term issue and not something that's just going to fall off the radar screen over a couple of years. Um, so again, you know, it's pretty stark as far as the recoveries relative to the effort and the amount of money spent to make those recoveries. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, what we see in the types of things that we get in our program is also what is widely reported by the Office of Inspector General, who puts out an annual report every year of the types of recoveries that they see um, you know, to the Medicare Trust Fund. Uh, typically, the types of claims we see are claims where the um, OIG, or Department of Justice, is making uh, an issue with 
whether or not something was medically ne necessary or if the patient care was provided in the wrong setting. That, that makes up for about 40% of the claims that we see uh, that come into our program. Incorrect coding, which could be as simple as you know, a, an allegation of upcoding, whether it's going from a level two to a level three or a level three to a level four, or in the hospital setting, whether or not you're putting in the correct ERG code. Uh, we see about 35% of our claims come in where the allegations are basically incorrect coding and uh, tilting those incorrect coding allegations towards something where they believe it's more than erroneous. Uh, so we see a lot of claims come in on the in incorrect coding side. Um, lack of documentation is another way that Medicare or even Medicaid, and, and, you know, Medicaid pretty much shadows uh, Medicare initiatives. But the lack of documentation, whether it's um, uh, uh, even a missing uh, signature from the physician, the attending physician, can create a problem uh, in a an allegation of over over billing. And um, you know the the old saying is if it's not documented correctly, the patient encounter didn't exist. Uh, so you know a lot of times we see claims that come in just because we have lack or poor documentation in the uh, medical record. Um, in addition to that, we have other types of claims that come in. Uh, sometimes they're duplicate claims, uh, same procedure for the same patient in the same day. Uh, that to me is more of a technical issue that we typically see as a result of um, inadequacies or inefficiencies in the IT used by the uh, physician group. So the types of claims that we see are very consistent with the types of recoveries that are being made um, on the OIG reported uh, websites. So, um, you know, that's just a general overview of the types of claims that we see. So we can go to the next slide. I wanted to spend uh, a few moments on RAC because it is something that is relatively new. I know it's been out there four or five years, but uh, it's a little bit more evolving with physician groups. And a lot of our uh, clients that purchase the coverage believe or misname our coverage as RAC coverage. Uh, but we are a little bit more than RAC coverage. But getting back to RAC um, and you know, why it's concerning in the physician community, number one, it has evolved somewhat from a focus on the hospital setting into uh, physicians and physician group settings. Uh, and recovery audit contractors are basically subcontractors for CMS um, paid to go out and look for improper payments. Um, and the biggest concern that we have as underwriters and also that you guys should have as uh, potential targets of RAC is that these RAC auditors are incentivized to find improper payments. They basically don't make any money unless they find errors. So. Uh, you know, they're pretty aggressive at finding errors, otherwise they're wasting a lot of their time and uh, not generating revenue for themselves. They have um, very sophisticated data mining expertise and capabilities. Um, their IT capabilities are you know, developed to uh, identify outliers, which will then give them a better chance at recovery uh, for the Medicare program. Now, they are incentivized to find the stakes on the other side as well. Um, they do get a percentage of recoveries that they make to the provider side, but almost 85% of the mistakes they find are the mistakes to the detriment of the provider and to the benefit of the Medicare uh, trust fund. So uh, they're basically looking for easy money and they're, they're pretty good at doing it. We'll go to the next slide. Um, you know, the other thing I'd like to emphasize when I'm out speaking about our program is that, you know, RAC is not just a nuisance, uh, but should be considered a, a pretty significant threat. Uh, and the reason is, you know, if they begin to see a pattern or practice of billing uh, that is non-compliance to the Medicare standards, it could end up leading to further investigation. Um, what RAC auditors have found initially in, in their pilot program is that there was a significant slide back in compliance programs. Um, a lot of physician groups, a lot of hospitals and other 
healthcare uh, entities had invested quite a lot of money uh, in their IT infrastructure and also their compliance programs, uh, probably going back you know, 10, 15 years ago. That's when a lot of investment and a lot of focus was put on the provider side uh, to becoming compliant with uh, Medicare regulations. But what they found is there has been a significant flyback. Uh, as much as people have compliance programs, um, what they found is a lot of them weren't implementing them to what they should have been implementing them uh, or to the degree they should have been implementing them. So, um, so that, that's been passed on to the government. And again, that's just more fuel to the fire as far as ongoing uh, regula regulation and ongoing compliance requirements. Um, the other thing that we found with rack audits is if they do find a problem uh, and they do find easy money to recover, they just do not go away. Uh, we've had submissions on the hospital side uh, from hospitals that have been involved in rack audits ongoing for nearly four years. Uh, it's pretty much they, they've set up camp at uh, some of these institutions and they constantly ask for files and they constantly find errors and um, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, these facilities don't have the wherewithal financial uh, capability of fighting or appealing the rack auditor's findings. So a lot of times they cave in and they just pay the, uh, what the rack auditor's findings are. Um, and uh, again, getting to the, to the point, this, these rack auditors are private entities and private enterprises. They're not hourly government employees. Um, they're contracted uh, companies that are stock companies in most cases, and they're out to make a profit and uh, are incentivized to, to find mistakes. So it's, uh, it is a, a, a concern, and it's a concern that's not going to go away anytime soon. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, we talked a little bit about the rack incentive structure. Uh, these companies are you know, basically uh, contracted on a contingency fee basis. And when time is money, uh, the more time it takes to recover, the less likely a target you are. And this is a pretty important principle uh, and component of our insurance program because if you have the financial ability to appeal the RAC findings and go through the appeal process, our hopes are as an insurance company and as an underwriter uh, is that um, you, know, you find success early on, uh, the rack auditor will then just pick up and go to the next easier target. So uh, it works in conjunction with underwriting principles and how we uh, underwrite and uh, even price for uh, this type of coverage. Uh, but again, it is, it is a concern, not only because you know, racks are a nuisance, but they can escalate into something much more dangerous for, for a physician practice or a hospital. So we'll go to the next slide. Uh, in addition to RAC coverage that we provide in our program, um, we provide other Medicare audit type coverage. And they can come in the form of ZPIC audits, which are zone integrity contractor uh, programs and initiatives that the government has put out there. Uh, again, we talked a little bit about whistleblowers. We provide coverage in the event that you have a whistleblower event or a key TAM action. Um, and we see just about every size and shape of Office of Inspector General or Center for Medicare Services types of audits. Um, there are Medicare strike teams that are out there that we've gotten claims in from. Um, there's even an OIG most wanted list for healthcare fraud. So uh, beyond RAC, like I said before, we have had a, a, you know, a full uh, gamut of coverage that is provided if, in fact, uh, one of our insurers is involved in some type of Medicare recovery audit. Um, recoveries since 1986 uh, are in excess of $16 billion. And to put that in perspective, that's over a 30-mile high uh, stack of $100 bills. Um, which is about what I'm paying in uh, tuition right now. I got three kids in college at the same time, so <laughs> it resonates well with me. Um, and in 2013, there was about 3.8 billion recoveries. Again, getting back to the return on investment, it's about $15 for every dollar spent. Um, it's probably one of the most, if not the only, 
profitable program the uh, government actually has out there. Everything else kind of loses money for it. Uh, so we'll go to the next uh, slide. So I want to talk a little bit more about insurance options that are available. And again, um, as much as we've been in the marketplace for over 15 years, there's still a lot of uh, people out there in the healthcare industry that do not understand or even know that a insurance, a traditional insurance policy option is available to them. Um, but again, as we uh, talked about, a lot of people kind of misname or mislabel our program as RAC audit coverage, but we do provide much more than that. Uh, we're out there defending and um, you know getting involved in Medicare and Medicaid audits for our clients. Um, we involve ourselves and provide coverage for commercial payer audits. We've recently added an ACO endorsement, which provides vicarious liability in the event that you are contracted with an ACO and they have a managed care liability claim and you want representation beyond what's provided through the ACO, and that would be defense representation. Uh, we provide coverage for ARC and anti-kickback laws, uh, so uh, self-referral issues that may come up and allegations of those uh, self-referral issues is something that we provide defense coverage and fines and penalties coverage for. Uh, we also provide coverage for HIPAA violations relative to patient privacy issues. Uh, MTALA is the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. We provide fines and penalties relative to MTALA violations or allegations of violations. And that, that's more, a little more for the hospital setting or emergencies, but we do provide that, um, you know, as an endorsement on our product for all, uh, all of our insureds. Uh, Boomer is basically Board of Medical Examiner Review coverage. So if you have a state licensing issue that comes up and you need defense, uh, we actually provide coverage for that as well. So we try to develop a program that is everything but medical malpractice. Um, and we try and limit, uh, you know, or, or take on the exposure beyond, you know, your patient encounter uh, issues that you might have as a physician or even as a hospital. So we'll go to the next slide. If you really drill down into what is being provided in the insurance product, um, the first thing that's uh, extremely important is the fines and penalties aspect of a settlement. So if you have a claim uh, which starts out as a, an OIG investigation or a Department of Justice investigation, once they determine what your overpayment was, they can come back and um, hit you with uh, False Claims Act fines penalties, which can be as high as $11,000 per wrongful bill that was submitted. And um, in addition to that, if the recovery that uh, they're looking for is, let's say, $500,000, they can hit you with uh, double or treble damages, which is two or three times the amount of the overbilling. That's the component of the settlement that we are uh, providing coverage for. We can't pick up the restitution portion. There was overbilling, there was overbilling, and that has to be paid back. But we do have to pick up, or we will pick up, uh, the fines and penalties portion of the settlement. But even more importantly than the fines and penalties is the defense that you get in the event that you're involved in a uh, OIG audit or DOJ audit. And the way we provide defense is we have 25 law firms or approximately 25 law firms around the country that have been um, identified as experts in healthcare regulatory issues. Um, and we've negotiated with those law firms uh, to provide representation to our clients in the event that there is an audit. Um, we also uh, work very closely with uh, uh, consultants that would provide shadow audit defense work uh, in the event that you are involved in an audit. And they're basically looking at the same uh, patient records government and making a case for you know why those uh, records were done correctly um, that to me uh, is and based on our experience and our claims experience that to me is the biggest uh, part of what we bring to the table um, because a lot of a lot of folks that can't afford to have a 
uh, a specialized healthcare attorney uh, at their practice are really uh, are really stuck when they're when they're involved in these audits uh, because once you are involved in an audit and you're out looking for an attorney that really knows what they're doing in this area and you're out there looking for a consultant um, it becomes very very expensive to do it that way with the insurance product you know kind of a carte blanche you've got it um, already set up we've already done the selection we've already done the homework. And uh, it's a matter of you just presenting a claim to us and we get the wheels uh, rolling. Um, so that's kind of a, a baseline of what we uh, provide, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, at the time of a claim. Go to the next slide. We talked about uh, the panel defense. Like I said, we have about 25 law firms around the country, uh, nationally and regionally recognized, that do this for a living. Um, in addition to that, we provide up to $10 million in uh, coverage uh, for physician groups and uh, hospitals. Um, I was recently in Indianapolis meeting with underwriters to uh, get additional limits available for some of the larger institutional clients that we have. And we're looking to be uh, giving a facility uh, of $35 million in excess of the $10 million available for the largest facilities in the country. So uh, we're working hard to uh, provide as much coverage as we can, uh, and uh, we're pressing underwriters to, to, to support that, that effort. Um, one of the big things that we provide that's kind of buried into the policy form is retrospective. So when you, as a client, join up and buy one of these policies, um, typically we provide up to 10 years look back on medical records that might be audited. So as much as it's a claims made policy, um, we do provide uh, a retrospective coverage uh, for work that was done prior to the effective date of the first policy. Um, the other thing I wanna get into is the last bullet point is uh, the patient data breach coverage. Um, to me, this is something that is evolving uh, and is probably as important as Anything else you would insure in a physician practice? Um, data breach, especially in this world where everything is so convenient uh, with internet and uh, websites and online paying uh, and uh, medical records being electronic nowadays, um, we are starting to see a number of uh, data breach issues and events that are occurring in the healthcare world. Uh, right now, what is, for the most part, is commercial payers getting hit or large hospital systems getting hit. But as this issue evolves, um, those hits are going to start taking place at the uh, kind of the middle market uh, where you'll see small community hospitals get hit with data breach. Uh, but in addition to that, you'll also start seeing physician groups get hit with data breach issues. So, like everything else we try to do, we try to evolve our product and add uh, coverage for things that are typically not covered. Um, so if we go to the next slide, just to give you a little background on you know, what, why this should be a concern for physician groups. Um, if your group is hit with a uh, cyber attack and there is then a breach in information, uh, where third parties have gotten into your systems and retrieved uh, patient information, whether it's names, addresses, uh, dates of birth, social security numbers, medical records. Um, there are rules, whether it's state or federal, that you must notify your patients that they were involved in a breach. Uh, and not complying with those rules is a more severe penalty than complying in the financial aspect of complying with the rules. Um, so, as a provider of healthcare and as a um, uh, custodian of medical records, you have responsibilities that are legal in nature to notify patients and also provide a, a host of um, uh, services to those patients that were involved in data breaches. So, we'll go to the next page. The breach response and cyber insurance component of our program does hit all those requirements 
uh, those legal requirements that are lined up or outlined by either state or federal reg regulation. And those would include uh, notification of, uh, you know, uh, patient notification of those that have been affected by the breach. And in many cases, if you take a look at what the, the costs associated with those uh, notifications are, it can be anywhere from 100 to $300 per medical record to uh, properly notify patients of a data breach. Um, so if you take a look and you back into how many medical records you might have on a system, uh, which would include not only your current, but maybe even former patients, it could be in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how larger practices. Uh, in addition to the uh, notification requirements, you would also have credit monitoring requirements where if you have a patient that's been breached and would like to be uh, involved in a credit alert um, uh, program, you would have to provide that to them free of charge. And I think that's up to three years. So that's also something that's part of our program uh, in terms of what we're insuring. Uh, attorney fees and expert fees and other expenses, which are typical of forensics expenses. And that's the folks that come in and really take a look at your system and determine what was damaged, uh, what preventative measures uh, were lacking, and what preventative measures have to be instituted. Those things are forensics expenses and legal expenses that are also covered as part of the uh, insurance program that's provided in our, under our um, a platform. Um, but in addition to that, um, if you do have a patient that was harmed financially uh, due to their medical record being breached, uh, you could have yourself a, um, a lawsuit from that patient uh, relative to financial damage claims. And that is also something that's picked up under this program. And everything I just went over is something that you will not find in your general liability policy or in your medical malpractice policy, unless your medical malpractice policy is providing a very small limit for defense. In a lot of cases, uh, medical malpractice policy is providing $25,000 or $50,000 in data breach coverage. It's really not enough to consider the exposure that most physician practices have or uh, any institutional program, uh, any institutional accounts might have. So, um, the biggest thing I think we bring to the table when it, when it comes to cyber coverage is the fact that it is something that's already prepackaged. Um, it's already uh, paid for through through premiums, and it basically becomes kind of a bad phone uh, situation for you in the event that you have a cyber attack. Just basically picking up and calling an 800 number and, and, and turning in a claim. And then, you know, we're the ones that are responsible from that point going forward, coordinating uh, the patient notification process, the credit monitoring programs, and bringing the experts in to look into uh, forensic issues that uh, that might need to be looked into. So um, it's a really you know, kind of a turnkey solution for that exposure that doesn't exist in most medical malpractice policies or general liability policies. Um, as far as the program goes, cyber side, separate limit of coverage that we provide. Uh, it can be bought in conjunction with the regulatory, you know, uh, billing errors and emissions coverage. It can be bought separate on a standalone basis. Uh, we can provide coverages as low as one million per claim, up to five million per claim, and it covers all those uh, bells and whistles that we just went through. So, uh, a lot going on uh, beyond med medical malpractice and beyond slip and fall liability that you might have as a uh, physician group. But uh, the good news is there is an insurance option uh, for these types of uh, exposures. You don't have to self-insure it. It doesn't have to be an unknown. It can be something that can be uh, ascertained and easily uh, priced out if, uh, if you're uh, interested in, in, in having an insurance option to these types of exposures. So that's about it. I know I go pretty fast sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully you've picked up a little bit about what I was talking about and, and the concept in general. Um, but I'd be certainly happy to discuss any questions you might have in private um, by either email or phone. Uh, Andy Martz, who's um, 
working with uh, Jill and her group uh, for a number of years is also available, and I left his contact information up there. Um, but it's an it's an easy uh, thing to get at least a uh, an indication and a pricing um, uh, proposal uh, to see if it's something worth your while uh, to um, to insure this rather than having it as a self insured um, unknown on the balance sheet. So, um, you know, I, I think one of the main questions that I typically get, and I'll, I'll answer it before anyone gives me the question, is typically what does this cost? And surprisingly, it's not that much. Uh, for a single dock, um, our premiums can range, you know, in the low uh, thousand to maybe 2,500, depending on the type of specialty. Uh, it's a million dollars in coverage. It's typically a um, uh, $2,500 deductible. Uh, for the larger groups, the cost per physician goes down significantly uh, to close to $600 per physician when we're in the very large group area. Uh, anything in excess of 25 doctors, we typically get down to that range. So it is a good alternative to at least look at. Um, and uh, if it makes sense, uh, it's, it makes sense for a lot of reasons, not just financially, but also just to have all those services available uh, with, at a moment's notice is, is an important aspect of the program. So that's about it. All right. Well, I've been here for anyone if they're interested in talking to us. We're available pretty much Monday through Friday, anytime. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jay. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I have included the handouts under uh, on the control panel for you to be able to download. Uh, if you have any questions for Jay, please use the contact information on the screen, or you can always email us and we'll forward the information along. If you would like a demo of our cloud-based single source compliance solution, please call us at 888 543-4778 or you can email us at info at 1sthcc.com. Thank you very much, and this concludes the presentation.